Uh, welcome everyone, welcome to Clary, welcome to uh, Silicon Valley Deep Learning Meetup. Uh, just a brief intro about Clary. Clary is uh, a three and a half year old company, uh, you might call it a startup. We uh, really focus on um, enterprise sales execution, our product uh, is designed to improve sales execution. We uh, deal with large sales operations, enable through data science, uh, a really uh, optimized way to run your sales teams. We use quite a bit of machine learning, Scala, and uh, predictive analytics technologies. Uh, so we uh, are very much into uh, you know, advancing the technologies that help people sell better. And uh, again, we are very pleased to uh, be able to host the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Meetup. With that, I would like to hand it over to Adrian. Thank you, Venkat. So let's give a hand to our sponsors. Well, everyone, hello, everyone, and welcome back. It's uh, nice to see so many faces made it to our uh, to our new site for this month. Uh, the other site, as you know, is having a little construction, and so uh, Clary was very, very kind to to give us space here and and host us in their in their beautiful facility. So thank you for making it, and thank you for finding the new place. Uh, I'd love to introduce our new our speaker for for tonight. So I'm going to do so as I always do from my notes, so I don't say something horrible. <laughs> so I want to uh, introduce. Uh, uh, Nima Gerda, uh, there we go, Gardida, yeah. Nima Gardida. He started his career as an engineer at Extreme Labs, which you probably now know as Pivotal Labs, at the forefront of mobile. And he was uh, moved on then to start a company as co-founder and CTO. Uh, learning from that uh, helped him become the head of mobile at Frank and Oak, and later on the head of product at Taplytics, where he worked with his cl with clients like Target and Tinder on data-centric product design. Now, from there, he's back in the startup game again and co-founder and CTO of Sudo, uh, a one-to-one -one product recommendation service, which, of course, he'll tell you a bit about along the way. But uh, Nima's really going to talk to us tonight about his personal journey uh, through learning about machine learning techniques and solving problems with uh, you know, maybe not so much data to start with and a team that wasn't trained at machine learning and AI and how he and his team sort of grew up in the, in the AI and deep learning space, how they went out and found out what they needed to know and bootstrapped themselves up and now built a company that uh, has a machine learning as a very important part of its, of its regular functionality. So... Uh, Please uh, welcome Nima, and uh, let me hand you over to him. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to first uh, thank you for having me, of course. Uh, ooh, how do I go next if I'm standing here? No. Oh, you can come back. And okay. Uh, and sort of give you a background on, on me and then walk through sort of what we've done uh, at SUTO to sort of use machine learning technologies to help what we, what we do, which is uh, fairly human driven. Uh, so I'll, I'll walk you through sort of all that sort of stuff. Uh, so as, as I already said, I'm the CTO at SUTO. Before that, I was the head of product at Taplytics and did some mobile stuff before that at a company called Frank and Oak, which was a e-commerce sort of um, menswear e-commerce company. And Topolytics was an analytics company. But the main point I want to actually main, make here is that I have zero background in data science or uh, machine learning. I'm also a self-taught programmer, and I hadn't coded for like three years or four years before this company. So this was an interesting sort of intro for me to walk into a world that is still super academic and uh, needs a lot, I think, in terms of branding to help new programmers get in. Uh, but it was an interesting journey, and I'll walk you through sort of the problems that we deal with uh, at SUTO and then how we are currently solving them or we've thought about solving them uh, with machine learning or, or non-machine learning tools. Uh, so a bit about so SUTO. SUTO is a one-on-one -on -one product recommendation service. So if you want to buy like a TV, uh, you can ask SUTO and it'll give you a product recommendation and say this is the best one. And the way it works is through just a conversation. So this is an example of it. I don't think you can read, but uh, this person wants a monitor for their MacBook Air. I to ask them a couple questions, like what sort of work do they do on their laptop, and 
what their budget is, and then after all this sort of uh, conversation, they'll get a couple of recommendations for specific products that they should purchase. Um, so the way this works is actually like fairly, it's fairly simple on the user end, because you're just speaking to almost a person, but on the back end, it's, it starts getting a little complicated. So um, essentially, the flow, is, the flow works like this. You, still, you start speaking to an agent, that will have a conversation with you. The agent starts building this query of like what you want. So you may want a headphone uh, or a pair of headphones or a monitor. And these are the sort of use cases you'll have with it. And that query will go into our database and it will find the product and send it to you. Uh, the database is built by humans. So this is why I'm telling you we have an insanely human company. We have people doing research, figuring out what the best product is for category X and for use cases you know, A to Z. Um, and then we'll put that in our system, and then when you speak to the bot, it'll pick one of those products. If it finds it, if it doesn't, it'll raise a flag saying, I need a human to figure out what the product is, so I can give it to the user. Um, so um, the query building in the recommendation side is something that's still fully human for us, uh, because mainly our problem is on the conversation side. Uh, and I'll walk through sort of how, how big this problem is. Um, so, we need to do essentially three things when someone texts or SMSs or emails Suta. We need to first find out what, what they're talking about. Are they talking about a pair of headphones, a mobile, a mobile phone, a monitor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then figure out what's missing for us to sort of make a recommendation. So if we know they're talking about headphones, have they mentioned the price? Do they know they want an in-ear or over-ear headphone, pair of headphones, and all this sort of other stuff that we need to know? And then from there, we can then start actually questioning them and sort of uh, conversing with them, or just make a recommendation right away if they've given us all that we need to know before we can make a recommendation. So let's let's walk through actually these three points and see how we've sort of solved them. So when we first started Suto, uh, it was just my phone number on the site, so all these problems were very easy because I was just texting people back. Uh, now it's gotten a little complicated. So the first thing we did <laughs> was figure out the categorization problem. So um, what we need to do is essentially from that text. So you say like, hey Suta, I'm looking for a pair of headphones for working out. We need to realize that like they're talking about headphones. And we know, we know what headphones mean because in our system we have an ontology of products and we understand like headphones mean this and we have to ask these questions for them and all this sort of stuff. And that's built by the experts. So like we have a tiny almost brain that knows about products. Uh, from there, we need to figure out the headphones, and then we have to figure out like the query requirements, and then start start conversing with them, right? So this is a simple like natural language classification. The best part of this is that I didn't know it was called natural language classification until maybe like the third week in when I was trying to build my own models. Um, but it's called natural language classification, and what we figured out, what we needed to see, really seriously figure out is that a what this product is, uh, what this uh, question is about, and we need to be 100% sure every single time. Because if you text us about headphones and we think you're talking about speakers, that is an awful experience. Because the questions for speakers are totally different than the questions for headphones or, or TVs and laptops and all these sort of uh, products that might be in the same sort of realm and category, but the, but the questions are totally different, right? So we had a couple options to sort of mess around with. The first one, which was my favorite, because it was super easy, was keyword matching. Uh, like, if they're going to talk about headphones, they're going to put the word headphones in there, right? Um, so I'll talk about why we didn't choose check key keyword matching. And the obvious second one was uh, natural sort of classifiers uh, that we could use using machine learning techniques or naive base, which is still machine learning. And then the third one was what we started with, which is human-based sort of categorization. We'll just be like, OK, these are, they talk about headphones, and then send it to the next person that's going to deal with this question. Um, so for keyword matching, it's not really a good option because of this specific use case that we thought was going to be very rare, but it turns out it's very not so rare at all. So if people want a product, sometimes they just want to replace something they have. So they're going to mention the name and sometimes not mention that it's a pair of headphones. So this is a pair of headphones for working out. It's called Jaybird X2. It's actually one of the best ones out there. But no keyword matching technique would have done this unless we had a list of all products that exist in every single category and then figure out how to keyword match from there. So we kind of dropped this very quickly. The moment a few of these questions came in, we realized it's just not going to work. Um, so the second thing we looked at was classifiers, which made a lot of sense um, because that problem wouldn't exist. So like they, they come maybe with the Jaybird X2, and we might match it with a headphone. We might not. If we get a false positive, we could deal with that, et cetera. Um, the problem with this was it was not 100% accurate. So we'll never get like 100% accurate sort of result from this. 
uh, and we might get some false positives and all this sort of stuff. Uh, we tried a bunch of different models here. We tried Watson's natural language classification system, Google Predict has some interesting stuff, and Amazon's machine learning sort of infrastructure has a bunch you can play with here. Uh, so we put all our data in, in all these systems, we tried them out. Uh, they do okay, actually, so they do, they do relatively well. Um, eventually, we got to a point where we, TensorFlow came out, so that was a couple months ago, and uh, we spent about maybe a week trying to build our own models, and we were able to beat some of the out-of-the-box stuff, which I'll walk through sort of how we were able to beat them. Um, and the third option was obviously humans. Uh, it's almost 100% accurate. So it turns out humans also fail to classify questions sometimes when they don't know the category well. Um, so I don't know, maybe many of you didn't know that Jaybird X2 is a pair of headphones, and you would have had to Google it. Uh, but when you want to sort of solve some of these problems, you don't have, you don't want to pay too much uh, to the human to spend way too much time on them. So uh, these problems for us need to be solved very quickly with not a lot of sort of money behind it, right? So. Uh, the main problem, obviously, here is that it's not scalable. If we want to have like 10 million people use this system tomorrow, we'd have a problem with that. Um, and we may have to ha hire hundreds of people to sort of support a usage. So uh, we really didn't like this option as the main option. So our solution is, I think it's fairly obvious because of the title, but it's obviously a combination of some of these approaches. So it's essentially we have classifiers and humans working together to, to solve some of these problems. Um, so if the question comes in, the first thing we do is we run it through the classifier, and then we, we look at it and we say, okay, do we have high confidence that this is a pair of headphones? And if we do, we'll, we'll just go through our system. We're like, okay, this is, we're talking about, about headphones and we'll start questioning the user. If not, we'll just send it to a human and say, can you double check me? And the good thing about this is that because of the way we've set it up, we kind of know what it is most of the time. So it might be in the top five options. So we'll send you send sort of our predicted list to the human saying, we think it's one of these. Which one do you think it is? And it's very quick. So we, we spend less than two cents on figuring out sort of what the category is on, on, on questions that come in now because it's such a simple uh, task. Yes. Sorry, how did you set the confidence interval? Uh, so for I'll walk through that in the model, but essentially, uh, when you have, a, when you have as, as your output layer, you can look at uh, the confidence level for each of the categories if you set it up as a, as a regression. And then you can use that to figure out, okay, I, my model thinks that it is this sort of uh, probability of this category is this, the other one is this, and then you can just use that to sort it out. Um, someone's phone is, I think, vibrating. Anyway, so. This is still not a perfect model. It's maybe 98% accurate because the model will give us false positives, even though it thinks it's 99% sure that it's a pair of headphones. It might not be, uh, which is a, which we actually relatively found a way to solve a little bit, but it still happens. And then the human side is that humans also screw up. So we get sometimes where someone asks about you know product X, but we we think they're talking about product Y, and they have a user have, has an awful experience. Uh, and this is why I actually literally read every conversation still to this day to make sure this doesn't happen a lot and then walk in and apologize saying like our model failed and that's totally on me. Um, happens maybe once a week. Still not proud of it. Um, so let's talk about a, a bit about the, the model that we sort of built. Uh, so we got about like plus 10% on the off the shelf stuff uh, with just messing around with our own data and modeling uh, using TensorFlow. We were using a JavaScript library at first call, called, uh, we're talking about this, the Synaptic, and another one before that. The problem with that was mainly that was super slow uh, to train. And when you're trying to sort of optimize these models, you want to run through your data really quickly multiple times. And even though we had like, we were using a subset of our data, it was still super slow, and TensorFlow helped solve that a little bit. Um, so our original model is fairly simple. So. Uh, at this point in time, I had still zero idea what I was doing. I still have zero idea what I'm doing, I feel. But um, it's a, a normal uh, neural net classifier. The inputs were just the vocabulary, uh, vocabulary vector. So we just sorted the vocabularies, uh, the, the words based on frequency, and then fed it in uh, and trained it on all our data plus some of Reddit's data, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and we got sort of an output vector for what category would this sort of text fall into. Um, and this was fairly bad. It was far worse, actually, than the systems that were, that were out there. 
only 60% at, at best was uh, the accuracy. I don't remember the exact number, which is, like, which is why I put 50 to 60. <laughs> I feel like now I know that I should track every single number we, we achieve so I can chart it out over time or something like that. Um, back then, it was just 4 AM nights trying to figure this stuff out. Um, and yes? So I assume the output vector is also 500? The output vector was the number of categories that we had in our system, yeah. Uh, no, so the vo vocabulary vector is just uh, extracted from the questions. The output was the category, so headphones, TVs, etc. Those were each one in the vector. Uh, I think it's like about 3,000, actually. So, uh, now, uh, back then it was far less. Um, so the main improvement thing was something we noticed in our data. So uh, it turns out people buy certain products far more than other products. So we get certain questions far more than other questions. So about 80% of our sort of questions that come in fall into like a fairly small set of uh, categories. So one night I just decided like everything else is other. <laughs> so we got rid of like so many categories. So we got rid of I think 2,000 categories or something and decided that as long as I can do a really good job at predicting just the, be the most frequent categories, then we're going to have to spend a lot less human time uh, on figuring out what category it is, right? So um, the other category was actually like the main thing that helped. Even, even the off-the-shelf solutions came to the 70% using that because uh, we essentially like trained this model to figure out that it, kno it knows headphones and TVs and laptops and whatever other models that uh, we had a lot of data for very well and everything else fell into the other category and it got really good at figuring out the other category. The problem with that was, and still is, that uh, if a headphone sometimes falls into the other category. And that's okay right now because we just send it to a human right after, who then teaches our model that that's not other, that's actually headphones. Um, and then we used a term, term for frequency inverse document frequency stuff that I didn't actually know existed. I came up with this myself at some point and uh, it made a lot of sense. So essentially the problem with fre using frequency to come up with that uh, sort of vocabulary vector to feed into your model is that the words if or of or t the or the are used a lot across every single category, right? Uh, so that, that does not help the model uh, understand what words are more important for each category. So using this technique, you essentially get rid of those uh, sort of uh, words that are used a lot across all categories, uh, and only use the words that are used a lot within each within sort of their local categories. So then they, the, your vocabulary becomes only the important words that uh, sort of exist in, 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 your, in your categories. So then your model gets a lot better at understanding the difference between the words that come in. Uh, so with that, we went to a set essentially around 84%. Yeah, I put that in there. 84%. We didn't change the model almost at all in terms of the actual model. So this is what, what most maybe machine learning people call cheating. We just cheated with our, with our inputs and we got far better outputs out of it. So, um, and they include the output. So the output vector got a lot smaller because we had the other sort of category that covered about 20 to 30% of our data that we just didn't have enough information about. I th uh, and then this, this sort of solved the output problem, the input problem uh, helped out a lot. It just logically made so much sense to me as well. And eventually I realized that's what it's called. It was very easy, it's very easy to implement. There's no, no sort of like magic behind it, but it makes so much sense in terms of like how uh, the models should understand the text that comes in. Um, anyway, so I won't go as deep into the rest of the problem, but I want to actually walk through how we're thinking about it because first we haven't figured out all of it, so we're still like in the process of figuring out this, the rest of the, the steps. And then uh, B, there's like a bunch of stuff that I actually would love a lot of input from the community at, at large to figure out how other people might be sol solving some of these problems. But uh, after we categorize, right, we want to know, if you remember those two things, we need to know what's missing and then figure out how to converse with the user. So uh, when we categorize, we need to figure out what's missing. And what's missing is essentially figuring out if they've mentioned the things that we need to know. Uh, the things that we need to know, for instance, for headphones is about like four major things. We need to know what the purpose is, right? If they want to, to use it for exercising, if they want to use it for uh, at work and all this sort of different, uh, it's almost like a category of things that they fall into. Uh, the type, it's, if it's in-ear, on-ear, et cetera, and then the, the genre of music that they listen to. And most, most people don't know this, but if you, 
you need a, if you need a really good a pair, a pair of headphones, you actually need to know what genre of music you listen to because the sound signature of each headphone is different and they'll give you better sound depending on the type of music you listen to and then the price, right? So we think, and this is something we do mostly human and then some keyword matching to solve this right now, uh, is to we need to do entity extraction and figure out okay like they're talking about working out that means they're they want they're going to use it for exercising and that's one of the categories that we have right and then we use that information to fill in this sort of question knowledge base is what we call it and then at this point now we know that we're missing a couple things like the genre and the price so then we can start conversing with the user so we'll be like okay we're happy to help you with headphones what type of music do you listen to and they can tell us what the type of music that they listen to, and we can then gather that, apply this on the same exact um, uh, process that we applied to the first text, to the, this subsequent te uh, text, knowing what we knew before. Uh, so we still need to figure out if it's still about the same, same category. And this is the problem that humans do a lot, where they don't understand they're talking to a bot, that, so they might ask two questions in one hit, or ask a what we call non sequiturs. And so we need, to, we have a separate classifier <laughs> figuring out if this is a non sequitur or not. Um, and then we do a, a, another entity extraction figuring out, okay, this is, this is, this question was about genre. So they talked about jazz and classical music. We're going to put that stuff in and then keep going through price. We'll do the exact same thing until we get to the full knowledge base. When we have a full knowledge base, we know exactly what we need, we, we have all we need to know sort of what, about the question that the user has so we can make a recommendation. Uh, and at this stage, this is the completely human part right now, is we grab this information, we, we have people who know SQL very well, so we'll just dump this stuff in and do it sometimes, they have to modify it a little bit. Uh, but we think it's actually very easy to solve this problem down the road when we have all this information, so we're, f we're focusing essentially up the funnel on this one. But after you have the knowledge base, you can get to a couple products and then uh, we, we almost try not to converse at all after we make a recommendation. So most of the stuff that happens post-recommendation is a bunch of links that we give you. We'll tell you like, hey, just like press this link if you're happy with the recommendation. And if you're not, press this link and we'll have another person sort of helping you with the recommendation. And almost after recommendation, we think of it as customer service as opposed to sort of an automated experience. So if you go through an e-commerce site, all of this is e-commerce. After recommendation, any question you have is almost like customer service after you've like got the product. Because we, we spend a lot of time on the human side figuring out exactly which products to get, give you. Uh, and we have a very good understanding of the products, the sort of recommendations that we get. And we're fairly happy with the, with the quality of it. Some people aren't happy with the quality of it or have questions about why we've gotten to this answer. So we sort of walk them through it. But that happens with mostly humans. At least we haven't thought about automating that because it doesn't happen that often. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Suto. Um, and we're hiring. So if you want to chat about that, I'm happy to do that as well. Well, thank you, Nima, for the awesome talk. I'm very interested in following this along. <laughs> uh, this is, everyone, this is, uh, we always have our time to question and answers. I'd like to you know, invite everyone to ask questions. Uh, please, if you do ask a question, remember, um, one, somebody can bring you a microphone. That's good, because our viewers at home want to be able to hear the question. And then also, please say who you are, and you know, if you have some affiliation or something, just so other folks, when it comes uh, you know, networking hour, will be able to address you by name. So uh, you have a question? Hi, my name is Rahul. So the question is, uh, does the bot actually probe with a direct question if you have certain level in or a certain level of confidence in the category? So let's say someone said, I'm looking for a pair of Jaybird, and you're like, hey, are you looking for a headphone? Does it do that, or it does yeah. that? So like the, if, if it's fully sure that you're talking about headphones, it'll, and, and it, has, it is fully sure that you have given a what? set of information to it, it'll all right away speak to How you. How do you define fully sure? Like so we have like uh, over 95% accuracy okay. on, on, the, on the model. So if, if it's 95% sure, it's going to go with it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, but it's still like still all human, humans look at all the, con like we look at all the conversations still to make sure that these models are doing well before we scale this thing up at a scale. My name is Dr. Hi. So uh, hang on, is your mic on? Hello, hello. There we go. So my name is Doug Perry. So um, I'm, from from Doug? Oh, I'm from a company called Art.ai. Great. Cool. So, uh, question for you about how big is the data set that you trained on? Uh, 
I don't want to give you exact numbers, but it's less than a million, but over 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> uh, secondly, now when you determine that the na natural language processor has done, you know, like you say, a, a false positive, mm -hmm. how do you fix that? How do you do you we, back we'll have a human come in and it interrupt the whole thing? Sure, sure. But do you retrain? Yes. So okay. retraining is actually done uh, live. So we'll we'll have like okay. every every like about thirty minutes. Yeah. Uh, we'll grab everything that we uh, humans have yeah. done and then put it back into the models right away. And then we'll have another thing that picks it up and it uploads the models back into our servers. Very good. It's all TensorFlow stuff, so it's, it's fairly easily done right yeah. now. Because um, the data set is small enough that we don't care enough about the, the GPU usage that we get out of it. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Alexander VisionBot. So my question is a little bit more technical. Okay. Um, I saw there is like a neural network with less than 10 layers. It's like a simple multi-layer perceptual neural network, yes. back propagation or deep learning, or what algorithm you have used for learning, training the neural network techniques. The trainers are, so we got very lucky for using some of this stuff. So TensorFlow has uh, the SkyLearn sort of like a, a API. So I believe it's gradient descent and it's, uh, still a sigmoid sort of uh, multi-layer neuron. But I can take a look at it and give it to you. Because I tried so many different things, I don't remember what it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll, sh I'll literally show it to you afterwards. Hello? We have questions in the back. Hi, uh, my name's Stephen. Um, Stephen? Uh, Microsoft. So I was surprised when you said that adding the other class, an explicit other class, gave you so much gain. Yeah. Well, why was that, and like, what are the attributes to the other class? So, um, I, uh, to be honest, but like, there is no real way I can describe it to you. But the the sort of way I've described, uh, I've I've dealt with it in my head is uh, there was not an, so our database was not nearly normalized to really figure out uh, that there was like two maybe two questions about potty chairs, right? And the 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 words in it were not unique, nearly unique enough for that category to really. Uh, shine in the vocabulary. Uh, so when we got rid of that stuff um, and put it as other, the model got better at understanding that like headphones are actually like the word headphones might be mentioned in far more. Uh, that's how sort of I've rationalized in my head. But uh, if you can fi find a better explanation <laughs> as to why this worked better, uh, I'd love to understand it better as well. <laughs> right. And well, when you say normalized, normalized with respect to the, the topic? Like the uh, yeah, to topic? the topic, yeah. So, like we might have like a thousand headphone questions, uh, but only like two questions about toilet papers or five questions about potty chairs, right? So we try to normalize it a little bit, but we can't really normalize those questions that we only have like five or ten, ten with. So we'll cut a bunch of headphone questions that we think are insignificant in order to sort of bring it down, but not not nearly enough uh, questions are. Uh, we've gotten not we haven't gotten enough questions across all categories to be able to do that and then have like the same number of sort of questions across every single category right so uh, for like I spe I mentioned headphones a lot because that's actually our most popular one so we have like thousands and thousands of these and if I had just left all of them in there our model would always think that it's a headphone so we had to get rid of a bunch of them to so, sort of give leeway to the other categories so the model understands them better yeah. okay, thanks. my name is Somnat I'm from Walmart Labs Hey, I have two questions. One is actually related to this others thing. So when you put something on others and measuring the accuracy, it could be misleading. I can imagine if you put everything on others, you will have 100% accuracy. So earlier you have like 3,000 categories, and now you club something on the others and your accuracy improved. That could mm -hmm. be just your class levels are nice. So, so, so the reason this other thing works is because we care a lot about. So this is like that. That behavior is okay. We're okay with that behavior because we care a lot about getting uh, sort of. We're getting if, get, if we're getting false negatives, that's far better for us okay. than getting false positives, right? So if you bunch a bunch bunch them to the other, it might actually think those others are uh, headphones or others, right? And I'm, we're okay with that because that way it will go to a human and the user won't have a bad experience, right? Uh, so that's how we rationalize the other for, sort of problem and. Uh, the, the data is still in there, so like there's still the part of the vocabulary. Like they'll they'll be in the other, but it's just not not uh, any of the categories that we care about right now. Okay, yeah. but there is a trade-off, right? The more you put in other, more human work. Yeah, and yeah. maybe so, the classifier accuracy is actually not improving. It is basically oh, that other. Oh yeah, probably <laughs> yeah. But for for our use case, it sort of gave what we needed, right? So my next question is uh, the way I understood is you fill up the template as soon as you're done, you do a DB query and answer that. 
But often time in real behavior, the customer could be flexible. I say, I say, I want a headphone below one fifty dollar, but I don't mind if you show one seventy or one eighty or one fifty five. Yeah, that's why at the end, that's a human answering your question. So we, so eventually we need to fi figure out how to do the fuzziness of it. So like, you may be close to humans. Okay. Yeah. Um, then how do you think this uh, can be scalable? So I'm just curious, like how many human beings are involved in order to help like categorization or even yeah. identify additional attributes from the product? So I think we're in a lucky year because you know, Amazon has a system called Mechanical Turk that's built for solving very, very small problems like this. Uh, so the recommenders, the people who make the recommendations, we have in-house. But all the po conversation parts, we don't have anyone working on that in-house. We just send that task to Mechanical Turk and it's, it comes back in less than a minute because it's such an easy thing to do. And then some people, because it's such an easy task for them, they just do this all day for us and they just go at it really quickly. Um, so we, we want to obviously get rid of that part and uh, it, it's bad for our business because we spend money on that part of, the, um, part of the business where it should be all automatic. But it can actually scale up fairly well. We, we have spoken to many companies that do this at millions of people at scale. Uh, actually, a couple companies in India handle this, and it's all human, uh, which we're very surprised to see was all human sort of handling everything. Um, and, the, the, and they still are able to sort of hit their margins far better than us because they've gotten some economies of scale. But uh, we think even about 20 to 40 percent human interaction, we're going to be a, a, a fine business. So as long as we can keep it below that rate, that's sort of where, where, where we're going to be happy. Obviously, we're going to be wanting to do it 100%. But we have the leeway to not have to do 100% because of the way that our business is set up. OK, one more is like from, the, kind of from this human being uh, judgment, do you do more like a online retraining of the model or just like say yeah, so we, append, we, to the, append to the training data and the train from refresh again? Yeah, so that's what we, we just talked Right now, so they're all TensorFlow models, and we will retrain from scratch because we don't have nearly enough data. But it happens like every X number of minutes. I think it's 30 or 45, where we'll just retrain it. It takes like two minutes to retrain, and we'll just upload it right away. Yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, 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 actually, just a follow up on that uh, training <coughs> question. So it implies that you just have one machine learning model with all the categories, right? You just use one model to score all the category you, you provide. And mm -hmm. uh, from what, what I understand is that actually you just uh, grab the meaningful keyword from the conversation yes. as a training input, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you know like uh, uh, you need to shrink the category? Yeah, so is some yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So the problem, the problem is essentially when you have a new question come in, you have like a vocabulary vector, right, that you had to work with before. So you have to follow that same sort of system uh, with the new question. So we have, we have a mini database of the vocabulary vector that we use in order to, in order to sort of uh, uh, come up with a new one. But every once in a while, I'll read the whole vocabulary vector because there might be new words that we hadn't gotten before that are important. But also, do you like uh, relabel the, your, your training data set, right? Because maybe you say like there's a human side, right? mm -hmm. the false negative, false positive, you need to relabel. That means that you actually... Yeah, we, we go from scratch. So the oh, retra okay. it's retraining, not, not continuous uh, training. Okay, it's retraining re from scratch. We don't have enough data that we care about continuous training right now. Like retraining takes a few minutes. Okay. Actually, so we're okay with it. Technically, you just only do all offline batch training. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Okay. But it's, it's automated, but it's still technically offline, yeah. Good evening. My name is Fred Hornbrook. I'm the principal and managing director of Phileas Fogg's Ventures. And my question to you is, how do you hope to make money with this? So the, our business model is affiliate. So right now, every time we give you a recommendation, we most of the time is on Amazon. Uh, and we'll get a cut of each purchase that is done through our link. Uh, and that's actually how all this works. So. Uh, all the models that I talked about, they're actually, we actually break even on the questions that come in, and we make about 20 to 30% on, on top of the money we get from the affiliates after we spend the money on Mechanical Turk and the humans to make the recommendations. Uh, yeah. And who are your customers? Customers are mostly, we were talking about this, um, households with two or three people. Uh, the mother usually is the main user of Suta, where they'll buy a lot of stuff for their house and their kids, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have, uh, a separate sort of category. It's a bunch of 
techies that really love new products. So lots of uh, stuff that, like on the electronic side, we get a lot of users that really love us for, for on that front. Yeah. You actually have customers now? Yeah, yeah we have thousands so of customers. So you're making money? Yeah, we're making money. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Craig uh, with Clary here. I was uh, just wondering uh, with the vocabulary vector, it's like an n-hot vector kind of. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I guess there's a frequency of each word. Maybe. Each word. So the, the two things that are important is the frequency of the word across the whole data set and the frequency of the word in that specific category. Got and that's it. what you, you, you sort it reverse order. So you sort it for uh, with the ones that have high in, it, in their respective categories or you inverse order it for the ones that have high across the whole data. Cool. Like yeah. a TF idea. Yeah. I was wondering if you'd played with um, like word vectors at all. If you'd... So we... I want to, but I feel like, so I really want to. That's like the next thing I want to try. Um, I haven't had the time to look at them yet, but uh, what I'm worried about is that I may have to train on another data set first, then use it in my own sort of system, um, which is totally fine. There's, it takes like a couple hours of time. So every time I think about it, I'm like, ah, I gotta spend like a full day on this, and I don't want to do it yet, because we're fairly happy with this part of it, and now we're going down, down sort of this, the, the part of speech tagging part that is far more important to us. Um, but yeah, I really want to try it a little bit more on that front. Cool. And and how do you rate products? Is it like because I go to Amazon, I see like what has the most stars, right? And then I kind of worry if that's gamed. It's gamed most yeah. of the time. So we, uh, so we, we, there's a couple of companies that spend spend their time just on the re uh, ratings problem. Uh, so Amazon reviews, and the Wirecutter has a great piece on this. Are f gamed insanely an insane amount. Okay, um, and. There is now models that help you figure out if this review is fake or not. So we use those all the time. We'll just like copy paste these into like these other apps that have trained their models on multiple like fake and real ratings of products, and we figure out if this is fake or not. But the research process is fairly long and extended. Uh, there's like a three-page paper that we give each researcher and say, this is what you have to go through. And a lot of it includes like actually trying the products out, calling the manufacturers, asking questions about customer service, and all this sort of stuff that includes in there. But uh, I assure you the recommendation. We're fairly happy with that three-page process now. <laughs> Hi, my name's Matt Sue. Could you use Mechanical Turk to flesh out questions of the categories that you are kind of weak in with questions? Um, to figure out what questions to ask, or? To ask questions to help create training data. Right, uh, we could. We, we, we t we've talked about it from time to time. The, the investment in it doesn't make sense, <coughs> because we would far rather have our users ask us about something that we don't know about, then invest the time in it, as opposed to do it ahead of time. So if we have a 1,000 people asking about potty chairs, then we'll do the research on it. So then, so it makes a lot more sense to wait for it to be inbound as opposed to doing outbound because it's a bunch of money spent on things that we're not even sure are going to come in. Yeah, that's the way we think about that. Hi, my name is Matt from Schumann Logic. I am uh, wondering what's the conversion rate? It is a business model related. Yeah. Um, How many? So what percentage of the? Yeah. So we get about let's say if we get a hundred questions and about. 20 of those people will explicitly tell us, or sorry, 20 to 20 to 30 of those people will explicitly tell us that they have purchased the product that we've recommended. But only about 10 to 20 percent of of those like 30 people that have told us they purchased it, we end up getting the money for, uh, mainly because of attribution problems. So like they'll click on the link and they're like, okay, I'm going to buy this, but they buy it like an hour later on another computer or another browser, and then we don't end up getting the money for it. Uh, which is fine. We can solve those problems with a bunch of like different email campaigns and all this sort of stuff. But that's how that works. Uh, so I guess it's 30, and then from the 30, it's about uh, uh, another. It gets another like 30 or 40 percent on top of it. But we get around four dollars per question on average, which gives us far more than leeway to figure out how to automate most of this stuff. On converted question. On average. On every question. Not on every question, yeah, yeah, on convert a question. But on the other side, if, if we can figure out, uh, yeah, yeah, on convert question, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to sidestep the pseudo agent for a bit and just ask a bit about the underlying data. Um, how do you handle things that can exist in several different categories? Um, like? Like a car, for example. That could be an SUV, it could be a sedan, it could be a family vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm just asking, you know, I want to buy a new car. Yeah. 
for the family, for example, what do you do with items that can live in several different categories? So do you have any kind of like, composable categories? Yeah, we call it like a master category, and then we have f many many subcategories that come with it. But it's part of the questionnaire. So you'll have a car, and we'll ask you, are you going to have multiple people, and is it going to family type? So that would be the type, and then you go down. So we think of each of these questionnaires as a, as a tree, and then we essentially go down and traverse down to sm make the so uh, solution space smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to a point that there's only like one to five options left. And then we'll be like, OK, these are the five things you should buy. That's how we think about that. But uh, so for a car, specifically for a car, for instance, there is something like 12 questions we need to ask before we get to an answer. Uh, and it'll start with like, how many people are going to be like traveling with this? Are you going to travel a lot with this? You keep going down the list to sort of reduce the number of uh, results in the system. Yeah. Um, all right. Could, could you tell us a bit about the, uh, the data structure of the underlying posts? Um, yeah. I want to kind of show it to you, but essentially, uh, the way we think about uh, the category is uh, there is one category and it has a bunch of related categories. This is very, very uh, actually. So if you look at any e-commerce system, they've already solved this problem for you. Uh, so they all have this master category that has a bunch of relatives. So for instance, uh, a headphone might have relatives that are speakers uh, and other electronic systems. But then you go down into a into a headphone category, a category and there's a bunch of sub categories that could have their own subcategories, right? And the way we design the questions, and the design of the questions is very, like, very human process. We'll fi fi find the most optimal way to uh, get to the bottom parts of the nodes in the tree. So do you support anything that's non-hierarchical, like tags? Like if I wanted to be a dick to pseudo and ask like, hey, I want to buy something for under $200 that's red and American. <laughs> uh, not yet. All right. So in those in those scenarios, um, it won't pick it up, which is why we haven't fully automated the last part. So a human will still take a last look at the conversation before pressing send, essentially. Mostly, yeah. One more question. Um, I think this year there are a lot of topics about chatbot. And uh, I'm curious whether you are, because right now, uh, Suto is like you have to wait for five or six hours before human, some human beings probably about the Suto going to do. Like, is that trying to live with some chatbot, probably have some natural conversation going on before routing to the human expert? Or right now, it's, uh, it seems like just one shot. I, I said, I want something. Then I have to wait for a couple of hours. Um, at least personal, I think it's not, uh, just my personal feeling is that it's not a very good user experience because if I want to buy something, I want to get a response. When, when did you try it? Um, just like a, a car, just like during the meetup, so. <laughs> oh, that's just now, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so it turns out the six to 12 hours on average doesn't matter to people who care about the best of the best, uh, but we tested this, like we were like, okay, what if we had people who were up all night answering questions to make sure that we get it? Right now, the problem with the 6 to 12 hours is that we have so many questions, we can't handle it fast enough. But um, the problem, we obviously want to get, get rid of the 6 to 12 hours. Like, it just exists right now because we have scaled faster than we could. Uh, we literally like, have people talking about it enough that we've gotten enough users that we have slowed down the people who end up sending you the recommendation. Or you end up asking about something that we haven't done before, and that's another case that will slow down. Um, but Obviously, we eventually want to make the whole thing automated in terms of the conversation and getting the recommendation, but almost never automate the research part because the research part will take a lot of work in, on the human side. So we'll invest more and more on the research part and less and less on the sort of having people converse with the, hum with other, with the users. Uh, so the chatbot thing just makes a lot of sense for solving this specific problem because if you think about it, you know, 10, 10 years ago, the way we solve this problem for ourselves is that we would buy and walk into a store and ask someone those questions. Like, we'll ask the Best Buy guy about, like, what is the best thing? Like, and they'll talk us through it. And we want that experience from Suto, but we want it to be done everyone at massive scale, right? So that's the way we think about it. Um, it's not there yet, but it's going to hopefully get there. Yeah. Thank you so much.